All righty. Thank you so much for the introduction, Talia. Um, right. So I hope everything's going well. Uh, so I hope you're enjoying the conference. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about orchestration without the headache, remotely train YOLO v5 using clear ML. Right. Uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, first, who am I? I'm Victor. I'm Victor Sunk. I'm a developer advocate at clear ML. Uh, I have about four years of ML engineering experience, which is in this business a, a bit, uh, right just enough to know the pain points and like how annoying it sometimes can be. Um, also, I make uh, YouTube videos, blog posts, uh, contributions to open source, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, who is ClearML? Uh, opens, we're an open source MLOps platform, so uh, focus on the open source. Um, it's essentially just a toolbox for ML engineers, data scientists, everyone that uses data and machine learning in their day-to-day -day activities. It just makes it a lot easier. So we have a bunch of, of those tools. Uh, the experiment manager is one of them, but remotely training uh, or like remote execution is another one. Um, you can find us at app.clear.ml if you want to get started, uh, but I'll give you more uh, yeah, info about that in just a minute. Right, so what are we talking about today? Um, we're doing experiment management first. So I know this talk is about remote execution, uh, but still we're going to start with experiment management because that is where ClearML basically starts off with, right? Uh, it's not a big deal. Um, it's not a big part. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the remote execution mainly, uh, but it is, a, it is the foundation and you'll see why in just a minute. Um, and then next to remote or after remote execution, I also want to show you a specific thing uh, that ClearML can do, which is cloud auto scaling. Uh, which you can uh, see in just a minute as well. All right, so let's get started. Experiment management first. Uh, what do I mean with that? Or like what, uh, what am I going to talk about is it is actually already integrated with YOLO v5. So if you have checked out YOLO v5 over the past few um, um, weeks, then you've probably seen that ClearML has been in there already. Basically, the only thing you have to do is do a pip install ClearML and then a ClearML init command. And once you do that init command, um, the, the system knows that it should communicate with your server. Now, how to get a server? You can actually get a free managed server at app.clear.ml or, and again, we're open source, not just the package is open source, but the, the full server with the web UI and everything, everything is open source. So you can just self-host your own if you're into that. Um, and essentially what that will do is it will capture all of the important inputs and outputs during YOLO v5 training. And what I mean with that is there is a lot of stuff captured. Uh, so what I want to do right now, and I'll be doing this throughout the presentation, is jump over to the ClearML server, the one that you can self-host or the one that you can get for free uh, at app.clear.ml and show you uh, what that looks like, right? So let me do, just go to uh, there. So this is the overview of the experiment manager. I'll make it just a little bit bigger so you can see it easier. Um, in essence, what we're doing here is we have two times that we train the model using YOLO v5's native code base, but with ClearML enabled. And what, what will happen there is it will keep track of so many things to try and make everything reproducible. That's the end goal here. So you have the source code, but also any uncommitted changes, any installed packages, uh, container information, and more. Configuration, like arguments, hyperparameters, um, artifacts like model files. So you get the gist, right? This is an experiment manager. Um, there is a general info console logs as well, obviously. Um, you have scalers, which is the most important part, <laughs> of course, uh, which you can see MAP, you can see loss. Um, so stuff like that is all captured. You have plots as well. So everything the, the, that YOLO v5 outputs uh, can be seen here uh, as, uh, as well, the confusion matrix, uh, but also confidence curves, et cetera, and the metric APIs, um, the MAP uh, metrics. And then debug samples, and this is a really cool one. I like this one specifically because you can then go, uh, you can go in there, and I don't, I can't get rid of my uh, zoom overlay, so I can't really show you how to go through. But basically, you can you can go through um, and then uh, see the different outputs of the model over multiple iterations. So that makes it very very interesting. And then the last part that is actually very interesting is. Um, comparing, right? So now that we have all of this information in the experiment manager already, what we can do, let me just uh, get select those two. What we can do here is we can actually select two or more of these um, uh, uh, experiments and then compare them, right? And if I can click on compare, what you can immediately see is that all the, the, the changes or all everything that's different 
can be is highlighted in red, right? That's the main idea here. So obviously, in um, the, the output model is going to be different. The execution time is going to be different. There will be uncommitted changes, differences as well. Um, but the most important or like the most interesting parts come when we go into the hyperparameters and the scalars and the plots and the debug samples. So what we can see here is that I, in between two of these runs, I actually changed some of these hyperparameters, right? Um, I did this in YOLO, right? I just changed the, the YAML file and then rerun, uh, rerun the training. So what ended up happening is ClearML kept track of that. And now I can compare the two over time. Uh, I can compare the two and then see what that has kind of an effect on the actual training, right? So now you can see that, for example, the MAP is a lot better in this training run, which corresponds to weirdly, by the way, um, the, having disabled all of the uh, augmentations. Obviously, to make it a little cleaner, you can hide the identical fields, which makes it very nice and gives you a very nice overview of everything that changed. Now, if we go and look into the scalars, we see that everything is tracked um, and you can compare everything. So all the losses, all everything is tracked as well. Um, and if I go all the way down, you can even see that the machine, um, the mon there is actually a monitor for the machine itself. So you can see that as well. If I go into the plots, you can see that uh, we can compare confusion matrices, we can compare confidence curves. And then in the debug examples as well, you can even chain them together. You can compare how the models are doing, right? So this is the essence of what the uh, experiment manager has to offer. Let me just go back to our overview here. Um, but there is more, of course. This is just the very, very beginning. Uh, so if I go back here to my slides, um, right, it's demo time over. So now we come to remote execution, right? And remote execution is the meat of the story today. The idea is to have it without headache. So the, the, the concept is you have already, you already have ClearML tracking using the experiment manager. So how can we seamlessly integrate remote execution into that uh, without obviously giving you a headache, right? So on the left here is the user themselves. Um, and we kind of work with a queuing system. So the idea is that a user can somehow, and I'll explain how that works, queue multiple tasks and ClearML calls them tasks instead of experiments, mainly because um, it doesn't always have to be an experiment. Like for example, your data pre-processing or your post-processing, that can also be a task. So it doesn't necessarily um, limit itself to only the deep learning models and the deep learning systems. Then there is an orchestrator that actually takes some of these tasks and takes a look at the different queues. By the way, each of these queues is um, manually input, right? So you, you can have as many queues as you want. There aren't any predefined queues per se. Um, you can define that however you see fit, right? Um, for example, in this case, I have a GPU queue and I have a CPU queue to which I want to assign different um, machines, right? So now we have those tasks in the orchestrator and then the orchestrator can take a look at all the remote machines you have available. And so maybe you have a remote machine from the faculty uh, of the university that you're working on, or maybe the, the, um, your team has like a big beefy GPU machine in a, in a dusty corner somewhere, uh, that might also be uh, useful there. And so the main idea is, is you can use ClearML and the ClearML agent more specifically to turn those machines into workers for you. And it's basically one single um, uh, command line argue, uh, command line command, right? So with just that single command, you can turn almost any machine into a worker that does these tasks for you. The orchestrator will look at those workers and because it's just a single command, it can be a cloud machine, it can be a local machine, it can be your own laptop. It doesn't really matter what kind of machine it is. It just matters that it's running ClearML agents. You can even run multiple ClearML agents on the same machine. For example, if you have a machine with like 16 GPUs, you could run 16 ClearML agents, each accessing one GPU. And now suddenly you can, you can handle a lot more load, right? You can handle uh, 16 tasks in parallel because you have 16 agents on a single machine. Now, the orchestrator will, of course, put those tasks uh, on those machines. It will keep track of which task is running where. It will um, yeah, uh, orchestrate reporting back. Uh, and then each of those machines will essentially spin up a, a Docker container. You don't have to work with Docker containers, but it's usually the best idea. Um, it will basically spin up a Docker container for each task, install all of the packages that we saw before, install all of the code that we saw before, apply the uncommitted changes that aren't already in Git, and then 
run the code again. And now, because this task within the code is the ClearML experiment manager still, right? The, the code is still there. So what we can do is, uh, or what happens then is that the task actually reports back to the ClearML experiment manager, just like any other experiment, right? Uh, and then it becomes really, really interesting. So the big question here is though, how are we going to get from our user to the queues? Like, how can we get our tasks into those queues for that auto magic to happen, right? And that's actually what I'm going to show you uh, right now. So it's actually very simple. We go back to the experiment manager and you, you heard me tell before that the experiment manager is the foundation, is the basic building block of your ML. Um, so we start there and we take one of our experiments that we had before and we can clone it. I'll just keep it, keep calling it clone of training for now, but obviously you, you probably want a better name, but now it's in draft mode. And when it's in draft mode, what you can actually do is you can change a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so for example, you can change which Docker container it should be running when it's eventually remotely executed. So I'm just going to fill this in real quick. You can even add um, extra arguments if you want to. So I want, for example, to run my code in the YOLO v5 Docker container because I'm sure it will, it's going to work then. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I want to add IPC host just to give it an extra argument. Right. But then this is all fine and good, but the real meat of the story comes when you get into the configuration, right? Because now we can actually edit any of these hyperparameters, right? So I can just change this to this. I can add some, uh, so like a random seed, I can change whatever I want. And of course, this is a remote machine. I expect this machine, or like I'm, we're going to enqueue this to a remote machine. So we expect this remote machine to be very, very powerful. So we can actually, for example, set the epochs to 1000 when compared to training only 10 uh, on our local machine, right? You can also change batch sizes and stuff like that, depending on, on your machines. Right, but now we're in draft mode. So how do we get it to those machines, right? How do we and add it to the queue? Uh, it's actually as simple as just clicking and queue. So you click right click and queue, and now you have the different queues here. I'll just enqueue it on the GPU queue and go. And so now you see that it's pending, right? Um, at this point, you will see that the machines are either spun up in the autoscaler that I'll just that I'll tell you in just a second, or the existing machines will take it on will take it upon themselves to start working on them. Um, and then also because currently it is running, so we can actually see console output filtering in in real time. So once the model actually starts training and once it starts running, uh, we will be able to see scalars and metrics and plots and debug samples pouring in in real time. So that's pretty cool, right? It's, I didn't get a headache yet. Um, and so we've already been training on the remote machine. So I think that's pretty cool, uh, but let me just switch back to the slides real quick because this is essentially the queuing, uh, the NQ, the clone and NQ system. You can do this straight from the code. You can just say inside the code, you can say uh, caramel task dot execute remotely and it will remotely execute it from the start, not even cloning an existing um, not even a clone in an existing experiment. But there's more. Uh, so this is essentially the demo time that I, um, that I just gave, but I didn't go as far uh, before, right? So now we have auto scaling. And this is actually a really, really cool thing. I must uh, add that the things you're going to see now, up until now, everything has been open source and completely free. The cloud auto scaling is actually included in the free open source version, but there is a nicer dashboard and some usability improvements um, that are in the pro version. So just so you know uh, where, we're, where we're at at this moment. So for cloud auto scaling, uh, we have the same diagram here, right? We have our user that can enqueue different tasks into different queues. We have the orchestrator, and then we have our cloud provider of choice. In this case, it could be GCP, AWS, or Azure, right? Now, as you can see, there aren't any machines here yet. And that's kind of the idea of the autoscaler is you don't pay whether, when there is nothing in your queue. Um, but obviously we want to add stuff to the queue again. So now the autoscaler pops in, right? The autoscaler will take care of to, to check and to um, talk to the orchestrator and to check, are there things in the queue that I should be uh, worried about? And the autoscaler will essentially say, okay, I detected two tasks in the GPU queue, one task in the CPU queue, uh, so given a maximum amount of instances that I can spin up, in this case two, I can actually spin up two machines 
and um, get going, right? So it will spin up two GPU machines for you, and it will spin up one CPU machine on any cloud that you provide, right? What it will do as well is it will add the ClearML agent to it already from the get-go. So these machines will take maybe a minute or two to start up. Then they will talk back to the orchestrator and say, hey, I'm ready to go. Uh, give me a task to work on, just like we would uh, in, an, in any like local machine, right? So then the orchestrator takes those tasks and then can uh, reassign them to the correct machines. But then obviously, because this time we actually have the auto scaling, so the actual scaling, the last task doesn't stay in the queue waiting for the other one to be completed. No, the auto scaler will just say, I'll spin up another machine and it will take care of that. Obviously, the moment the, um, the task is done and has reported all of its values, all of the machines have like an idle time, a final time that they can stay up. Um, and after that time, they will just uh, shut themselves back down again so that uh, yeah, everyone is happy, especially your wallet. Right, so how, what does that look like uh, in, in reality? So we have a little demo again as well. I, uh, I made a little meme for it too. Um, right, so let us jump back in here. So currently it's still running. Um, it takes a little while, but it's currently uh, training already. So you see the metrics running in, uh, coming in. And what I didn't show you before is that I actually have two tasks running. So if I, so you can add tags, 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 sorry, tags uh, to your uh, experiments. For example, YOLO v5 is the tag that I used here. And then you can actually filter on that. So there was all this time, there was a, a task running that I started way earlier um, that has been running for 808 iterations. And so this one has been running for a little while. Um, we do that because then I can show you the uh, dashboard for the uh, auto scale. Uh, but our, our task is running as well. Uh, everything is going well. We can see that the metrics are going up and down. Um, but what does it look like with the autoscaler? So if I go into applications here, we can see that the AWS autoscaler is active. And if I go in there, what we'll see is that we have at this moment zero idle instances, and we have no tasks in the GPU queue that aren't already being worked on. Right? This is the first thing the autoscaler will show you. And then you have the running instances, in this case, two. Uh, because we have the long running one that already started and we have the one that we just made. Um, so two machines are currently running. There are no warnings, good uh, for everyone. And you can see the, um, the actual output here as well. Now, to give you a little more insight, so this is the actual auto scaler. This, I think this is awesome because you can just, yeah, have no machines and then spin them up at, at your leisure. Um, you will have like a little bit of overhead to actually start the machines. But if your training is is taking hours and hours and hours. It doesn't really matter that much. Um, also, the cloning and the changing of parameters allows you to actually do hyperparameter optimization as well, which combines very, very well with this autoscaler. The last thing I want to show you is what the dashboard of these workers, these remote workers and these queues actually looks like. Um, so you can see here we have workers and we have queues. Um, we have the worker utilization over a three hour period, you can change this, of course. So you can see that the active workers go up and down and up and down, depending on how much load I put in the system, right? So I've been uh, trialing a little bit with these uh, tasks over the last hours. So you can see that multiple times the machines went up and up and down. Um, right now, of course, we have uh, three active workers, which is one for the autoscaler itself, and then two, the actual workers that we, um, that we use to do our calculations on. What you can then see here is that we have an apps agent. So if you obviously pay for uh, the pro version, we will spin that up for you. Don't matter, don't think about it. Um, that will cost you nothing. Uh, but then of course we have, it is running the autoscaler is what I wanted to say. This, it is running the autoscaler. And then of course we have the two machines that are actually running the, the clone of the experiment itself, right? So we have, um, yeah, both machines running here. We can see in the queue, it is uh, servicing the GPU queue. And then if we look at the queues, we can see how much of these uh, tasks were in the queue at any moment in time and also overall expected wait time. So if you're like with a large team and um, that you only have one machine, and you have like 10 people sending in experiments and tasks all the time, that makes it very interesting um, because those queues will take care of that for you, right? And then you can see uh, an, exper an experiment wait time or an expected experiment wait time in which I, if I enqueue something right now, how long would it take for me, um, for my task to be executed, right? 
So you can also see the overall uh, queued experiments. And then we have the CPU queue, GPU queue. You can see that we have two workers in here right now, and we have no experiments uh, that aren't being worked on. If there are any experiments in here that are or that need to be worked on, you can actually drag their priorities uh, just based on what you want. Uh, so you could, for example, say, okay, this person has priority for some reason. Uh, I will drag them up top uh, and the, uh, the workers will make sure that they will take that one as the next one. Um, so yeah, this is just a very quick overview. Again, all of this is open source. It's free. Um, I'll just give you a last example. So currently there are two of these um, experiments running. You can, of course, compare running experiments as well. So you will see actually uh, the, the, the live feed incoming on these graphs while it's being trained. You can do this for up to 10 uh, of these experiments. So let me then do a final thing. So imagine you're uh, training this on AWS or on GCP or whatever. Um, it is currently running and you say, okay, no, no, this is not exactly what I expected. It's not doing as well as I thought it was. Uh, you can always just abort it which would mean that it is now going into the mode of aborted, and then it will stop that uh, experiment immediately. The worker will be freed and will be free to take on another task and start on another experiment. So if I just uh, click here, we'll see that it's now aborted. And given a, a little wait time, you, you should be able to see that this um, the instance or the idle instance counter will in just a second uh, jump into one, because obviously uh, we've just stopped one of them but this takes 60 seconds to uh, to change so it should update momentarily right so this is actually uh, let me just go back so this is actually uh, the talk uh, i've hopefully given you a good overview of what ClearML can do and how easy it can actually be to just launch a remote uh, machine or like a, a remote training job um, just by cloning your experiment already uh, or just by remote execution in general. Right, so thank you so much for listening. Um, you can find us at app.clear.ml. Uh, our GitHub page is right there. Uh, our, we have a Slack channel as well with about 1,500 people uh, now. So there's always someone there to help you. Uh, you can definitely ask your questions there. We have goodest memes on Twitter, of course, uh, and my own Twitter is right there as well. So my last message is try it yourself. It's free, uh, so why not? It's open source. Uh, go and have fun. If there's any more questions, I already see two questions in the chat, so I'll answer them momentarily. Is there any more questions? Feel free to dump them uh, in chat right now. And thank you so much for your attention. Awesome. Right, so thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, that was really great, really in depth. Um, I do encourage everyone to go to the Q&A and ask him any questions. Um, I'll stick around for the next few minutes, and then I'll be hopping into the panel next. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I see that the first question here is, does ClearML support model training? Uh, so as you saw, model training, model training in itself is not part of ClearML, right? So ClearML essentially does the orchestration and it allows you to track models that are being trained using the experiment manager, but it's not like we have some click to train models ready to go. That is not the, the meaning of the platform. Um, it's essentially trying to and and empower you to more easily train your own models. That's kind of the main idea there. Um, is the AWS compatibility also free? Um, so yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that, yeah, you can actually use the autoscaler in the free version uh, and in the open source version. Only you have to like, um, it doesn't have the dashboard that I just showed you. That's actually the main difference. Uh, you can find both in our documentation. Uh, but if you look into our documentation, you'll see that the actual output of the autoscaler when run in the free version is meh, uh, while if you pay for it, it's actually a lot better. Plus you have to provide your own machine, your own mach remote machine to actually run the autoscaler itself. Um, so you do have to have like at least one machines, which we will provide for you if you pay um, for the premium. Premium is also not very expensive, by the way. It's like 15 bucks a month per person, uh, which is usually a lot, lot, lot less then uh, what usually happens is people just let their um, uh, uh, their cloud machines run over the weekend because they forgot to, to, to turn them down or like to shut them off. Um, and that will cost you a lot more. So I speak from my experience, this is uh, usually what happens. So is AWS compatibility free? Yes, uh, but if you want a better experience, 
you can you can also pay for it. Hi, can multiple tasks be run on a single worker if one task does not use the whole of the uh, GPU on that worker? So you have to define a worker and a machine. So a worker is one instance of the clear ML, um, is one instance of the clear ML agent, right? That will take every instance will take will be able to take experiments and run them. Uh, what you could do is you have like, for example, a machine that has two instances running, which is two workers running on a single machine, one of which has access to the GPU, the other one doesn't. You could say, I want to assign this one to uh, the CPU queue and the other one to the GPU queue. It will be able to pull two tasks at the same time and then run them on different, on like the same hardware, but the one with the GPU, one without. Um, so just so you know, you can do that. Uh, you can You can have like 30 workers on a single machine if you want to, but then those workers will be competing for resources. So be a little careful on how you deal with that. Uh, I hope I answered your question there. Um, thanks, Victor. Uh, does Autoscaler work with local machines? No, uh, the Autoscaler does at this moment not work on local machines. I also don't really see how that would work um, because your local machines are going to be um, limited, right? So what you could always do is if you have local machines that can also be used for other things, uh, you can always have the agents running on there and then just keep track of which agents track uh, or which agents are used to um, actually run tasks, right? Uh, because an agent that is just listening isn't really using anything. So at that moment, someone else could be using the machine. Um, but how would you scale? Like there is not a, a way to like generate machines out of thin air. Um, so I don't necessarily think you could do auto scaling on edge. Uh, yeah, you might have like a Kubernetes and like VMs. That might be something. And if you're into that and you you think that that make you that uh, would be very useful to you, yeah, please let us know. Um, just open an issue on GitHub, and yeah, we we might be uh, be able to give it uh, like to make it. Uh, but as of this moment, it's the auto scaler is mainly cloud, and then the, um, the 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 agent can be used anywhere. That is the main idea. Alrighty, I see that most of the questions or like all of the questions have been answered. Um, so again, I thank you so much, so much for your attention, so much for your time. I hope you have a great day um, and love the other talks. Uh, and I will see you next time and hopefully see you in Slack as well.